I don't, yeah. Makeup. I do need to worry about makeup. Okay. <laughs> would you please? That would help. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. It, it would. I'd worry about it if I had ever had hair, but I haven't. So. Oh, look at that. Nice. All right. All right. It's good. So uh, we're, I wanted this in a decomposition book. So I think we should have exams every week. Look at the attendance here. This is awesome. This is great. All right. So if you've got your exam, uh, please bring it up here. I think we're, let me just check on my mic. Testing one, two. Okay. <clears throat> So I have some, uh, some bad news today and some good news. Always, you, know, you never give bad news and good news without having both. Uh, the bad news is I was planning on doing solar observing today with the sun, uh, but that's the, and there's no sun today. We, you know, it's funny you should say that. You can, there's a lots of cool science you can do with solar observing on the moon because you're getting the diffuse reflected light uh, of, this, of the sun. And so you can make some very interesting studies about the integrated flux of the sun. Yeah? Uh, that, I don't know why it's reminding me of this, but I saw on Facebook yesterday someone posted, <coughs> what is the biggest planet like in Google? Yeah. And all the results come up with possible ways to finish the sentence. One of the results was, what is the biggest planet in the world? <laughs> the Earth. All right, but we can do some cool solar physics because I am the proud new owner of a 4.4 kilowatt photovoltaic array, which comes with an internet enabled reporting system that you can now monitor from any place in the world the photovoltaic system that's currently in, uh, gathering energy from the sun at my house, which is pretty cool. So I just wanted to just show this off because I think it's awesome. Uh, but, uh, but we are looking at the sun today, so we can't do any solar observing like with a telescope because there are clouds, but we can still observe the sun and look at how much energy the sun puts it's out. So. Fun. It does sound fun. Yeah, but we're going to stay in here and do this instead. But I, I wanted to point this out because I think this is crazy. It is... Uh, cloudy and we're still getting about a quarter of what this thing is capable of doing we're getting a, a, we've been around about a thousand watts today uh, so far for for our total power production sorry the peak is a thousand watts so that's about a quarter of what this is capable of and it's cloudy which I'm really excited about that because it means that uh, you can still produce a heck of a lot of energy even if it's cloudy and this is kind of a cool little system because you can uh, watch the time lapse of the power output of the solar rays as the sun comes up. And this isn't all that interesting yet because we've only been doing it for, you know, six hours or whatever since this morning. But you can see the power generation come up on the solar panels. You can plot up what's been happening. This, this, was, they, this was them installing the system. This was like coming online for the first time. At 5 o'clock last night when the sun was way over near the horizon, we were still getting 1,200 watts. Right? And the, it was a sunny day yesterday, so that was pretty cool. And uh, pretty soon this is going to go down. And it, it also tells us, so far we haven't saved any trees, but we're working on it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and our total energy, this tells us our total energy produced. And I just wanted to put this number in context. So, so far we've produced a little bit more than that. We're about 4.7 kilowatt hours. And I don't know if you're aware of how much energy you use in a day. We use at our house about 10 kilowatt hours per day. And so if you think about the units, kilowatt is a power times hour is an energy per day is power, <laughs> right? So, so it's funky units. But we use about 10 kilowatt hours every day. And uh, 10 kilowatt hours is a, is a unit of energy. So in the last, since this thing came online at uh, 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon, we have produced half almost of our daily energy usage. And we're not even a full 24 hours yet. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. How extensive is the setup? Now? It's very simple, right? So they came out. All they did is they slapped the panels on the roof, right? And they. The entire roof is covered. Uh, yeah, this is it right here. No, so. That's your house. So it's eight. It's eighteen. No, that isn't our house. Yeah. Oh, I, here I can show you. Here I've got a. I'll tell, show you what it looks like here because I posted some pictures. Because I'm kind of going nuts about this. It's really awesome. Um, 
password. Whoops. Oh, right. Oh, John, old password. I know. It's an old yeah. guy with old password. I know. It said I entered an old password. All right, so let's look at uh, my thing here. I'll show you what it looks like. Because it's not as extensive as you'd think. That's on Bryce's face. Here you go. <laughs> That's what it looks like. So to put this in perspective, all right, here's a better picture because you have a door, right? So it's not that big, right? It's like, it's like 12 by 36, something like that. It's uh, 18 panels, 250 watt panels. It costs about four bucks per kilowatt to install. Done, turnkey. Right? Grid tied, there's no batteries. So the way this works is we produce energy on the grid. Rocky Mountain Power gives us energy. At the end of the month, they bill us for the net, which usually will be in our favor. So they won't bill us. And we get energy credits that provided we use them by the end of the year, we, you know, so if we like, I don't know, get chicken, little, little chicks and have a heat lamp, we use up all that extra energy that we're producing before the end of the year. Uh, then we'll get, uh, we won't have to pay a bill. So right? you can all those trees to offset. I know, that's exactly, no, but if we don't pay it off, we don't get any money, right? So they don't pay us. If at the end of the year we have credits, we just lose them. Which I think has more to do, I don't think that's going to, that's going to, I think that's to de-incentivize you from putting like a one megawatt solar array at your house, which I don't think they would be accommodated, <laughs> right, with the power. But anyway, it's a pretty small, relatively small system. Um, and uh, the energy costs for doing that, so if you think about how much that costs, it'll take us about 20 years to pay that off, um, what the installation cost. So if you think about how much it costs to put it in, right, it costs uh, $18,000 minus 10000 in tax incentives. So, but even without the tax incentives, it's about a 25-year payoff. And that's just because electricity prices keep going up. Right. right now we're at about 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and they're talking about that being, what, double in the next 10 years? So anyway, I think it's cool, and it gets me to introduce, not only can I brag about an awesome solar array, but I can introduce the sun, because this is the future of everybody. We are sitting the safest minimum distance from a fusion reactor at one astronomical unit in my humble opinion, <laughs> okay? Now, uh, you all know about the sun as a source of energy for everything on Earth, but what is its source of energy? Fusion. Nuclear fusion, that's how we get the energy out. What's its original source of energy? No, well, yes. <laughs> but it collapsed due to its own gravity, right? So gravity holds this thing together, which creates the pressure and temperature that's high enough for you to fuse hydrogen and helium. And, uh, but if it wasn't for gravity, you wouldn't get the fusion, is my point. So it's really a gravity engine, because the gravity engine holds this thing together. The fusion results because you get temperature and pressure when you compress a gas, and you get energy output. And you know energy has to be coming out of the sun at about the same rate that gravity is hauling it together, because it's a ball. So the gravitational force holding it together has to be the same as the pressure force from the radiation coming out, because the sun's size isn't changing, right? And uh, it's an amazing piece of engineering, right? The sun. It's pretty cool. All you, all you need is gravity, hydrogen, and helium, and you have a fusion reactor. We did, well, yeah, we should build one. But so this is interesting. So they're, I just read the other day that they're, they're putting together, so so far we've done this on the Earth. But we've never done it where we get out more energy than we put in. But this doesn't get out any more energy than you put in. Right? But the energy comes from gravity. So. Right. So this is the trick for fusion on Earth. I'm not sure if you'll ever get past this fundamental rule, it seems, that to get a really awesome fusion engine, you have to put about as much energy in as you get out. Um, so right now on the Earth, when we make fusion, what do we do? We, we, we confine hydrogen ions to a gas. We um, la shoot laser beams in to heat it up. And we can produce fusion electricity easy. It's just you use usually more laser energy than fusion gets out. Now, one of the cool things that people are talking about is kind of taking the best of both worlds. Because the problem with this is that you can only harvest the energy from the sun when the sun is up, aka solar panels, uh, which, by the way, are the only new form of energy generation in the last, since we started burning things. Right? If you think about it, every form of energy generation is me burn stuff, boil water, turn turbine. Right? Solar panels are totally new, 
right? What would be nice is if you could somehow take this and turn it into an energy source you could use all the time. And there's a couple of options for that. One of them is you could harvest helium-3 from the moon. Helium-3 is produced in the sun. It is about three steps along the hydrogen fusion process. So you could take helium-3, harvest it from the moon, bombard it with protons, and get that last step of fusion where all the energy comes out for much less energy than it would take to produce an environment that would fuse hydrogen directly into helium. There's tons, it's, and we're going to talk about this today because there's a solar wind pushing helium off of the sun all the time. It gets implanted into the lunar regolith, the lunar soil. And uh, I think uh, last time I heard, you can, f you, if you could just have something that could scrape like the top six inches of, of soil on the moon, you could liberate enough helium-3 to use in this process to run all of the electricity on the planet. For right. For, well, that, oh, sorry, to produce the power output used on the planet at any given time. Okay. Current power usage. Six inches off the entire surface. Yeah. How? Okay. That's not very feasible, so what you would do is probably put a, put a Kennecott-type mine where you wouldn't go six inches down everywhere, you'd go two kilometers down in one spot. Although, no, that wouldn't work because the helium-3 th helium is only planted in the... In the so, th so you have to ask yourself, are you willing to basically bulldoze the entire moon <laughs> so that we get energy generation for the planet? Yes. yes. <laughs> Remake the surface, yeah. Well, and one of the things, if you're going to build a new colony up there, Right? So you have to ask yourself that question. The other thing that people are talking about doing, I was just reading about this, is because the problem with solar power, we have a beautiful reactor, but it only works when you're pointed at the sun. Uh, there's a, uh, a new, originally solar panels, they were trying, before we came up with the idea of silicon, uh, they were using iron oxide, rust. Right? Because if you take iron oxide and expose it to light, it does produce a very weak current. But compared to silicon, it's not even worth talking about. But what rust has over silicon is that you can immerse it in water and shine light on it, and it will, it will do a process where it converts the sunlight into current into high, uh, electrolysis into hydrogen, right? And so you can get hydrogen gas from sunlight, and then you can burn the hydrogen gas and do whatever you want with that. So that's, again, uh, it's, no, it's not very efficient. But it doesn't matter because water and rust are ubiquitous. Right? So th think about it this way, you're not very efficient. When you think of eating a hamburger, <laughs> no, it's true, it's true. <laughs> if you think about eating a hamburger, right? if you think about the energy from the sun, 1,200 watts per square meter hits the grass, cow eats grass, you eat cow, right? that's like 0.0001% energy. If you, do the, if you do the number of calories you ingest from the number of calories that came from the sun, it's very dramatically inefficient, but there are 7 billion people on the planet, so, so that works. rust and water would you need to power something? Well, I haven't seen the numbers for that. It's going to be a lot, but, the, but if it's distributed all over the planet, it, you probably wouldn't notice it. Uh, somebody once calculated that silicon cells, you could pave uh, a corner of, of Los, like this is Nevada right here. Right, you could make something about that size would power the entire country. Why? Uh, because there's a storage problem. So think about my solar panels. What do I do? I use energy from the grid, which is coal and gas and nuclear and all that stuff. And then I produce solar electricity and sell it back to Rocky Mountain Power. So I can't survive without the grid. Now my hope is that as we go along, the mix of, of fuels will change, right? I need the grid to be there because I have no way of storing my solar power. I could have big banks of batteries, but they're expensive and relatively inefficient. And uh, build a giant capacitor. People have this idea of uh, gra gravitational capacitors, where you basically use solar energy to pump water up into a reservoir, and then you run it over hydroelectric plants or overnight, right? So I think it's going to be a mix of solutions. But storage is really the problem. We have tons of energy. We can produce as much energy as we want. It's storing it that's the problem. So yeah. why don't we do something like a solar cell? Have a branch point where it's always coming. Excellent question. So there are proposals to put solar arrays, like the one on my house, in space, right? And you don't even have to put them at the Lagrange point. Just put a bunch of them in orbit so that there's always some of them in the sun. And then you beam the energy back to Earth via microwaves, like a big microwave tower. 
Now here's the trick, right? So you've got this huge stream of high intensity microwaves shooting at your tower and all of a sudden, you know, the gimbal on your satellite oh, goes offline a little bit. You know, it just fries a neighborhood. <laughs> but how is that different from, you know, a coal, coal explosion or a nuclear power meltdown? Like, everything's dangerous. It's essentially a death ray. Yeah, it's essentially a death ray, right. So you might want to have a buffer zone around. <laughs> Right? So I guess the, the upshot of this is that we live on a planet that is fueled exclusively by the sun. Even if you, fossil fuels are just fossilized sunlight. right? Because what did we do? We grew plants with the sun and then we buried them until they turned into oil. So the sun is really the name of the game. The question is how do we store it? Right? How do we use it? And so one of the reasons why I think uh, I wanted to study the sun is one, it's the nearest star and it's pretty cool, but also I think you were looking at our future in some form. Now whether it's solar panels on the roof, I fully expect in 20 years people are going to laugh at us and be like, I can't believe you put solar panels on the roof. You know, you, you can just use this helium-3 reactor. What's wrong with these people? Uh, that's entirely possible. Or everything's hydrogen based and they'll have solar panels in space that produce hydrogen and then drop it back on the planet for us to, or whatever. Um, but ultimately the energy has to come from the sun. Uh, the only energy source that I am aware of that is not a direct uh, not directly driven by the sun or indirectly driven by the sun would be nuclear fission. We're using uranium, but in a sense that was produced in a supernova explosion, so it also comes from the sun or a star, right? A sun. Uh, but but their nuclear fission does not require input from the sun. But name name me a sol name me a power source. Geothermal energy. Uh, and that's probably driven mostly by radioactive decay too. Okay, so okay, except for radioactive decay and fission, right? Name name another one. What's that? Wait, but what are you burning? People Yeah. Right. So so everything, all the hydrocarbons we burn are basically old plants, right? Um, I'm trying to think of. Uh, you know, and even if we go, if we get so fancy that we like make our own new hydrocarbons, how are we going to do that? We're probably going to use bacteria, to do that, and they're going to need sunlight. So, anyway, minimum safe distance from a nuclear fusion reactor. Uh, this has got all the pictures, and this is one of those pictures they show in um, elementary school because they're like, hey, we will learn that the core of the moon or the core of the sun looks like this. But my question to you is, how do we know that this is the structure of the sun? Because what I wanted to show you today, if it wasn't cloudy, is what do you see when you look at the sun? Uh, well, that's it. Yeah, what do you see when you look at the sun? Yeah, you just see this, right? That's it. So you see something that looks like it has a surface. And so my question to you is why does the, moon, the sun look like it has a surface if it's a ball of gas? It's very dense. It's not that dense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, well, so it's the same reason because at some point it becomes opaque, right? The reason Jupiter is opaque is not the same reason as the sun. The sun is ionized. The sun is ionized. Yes, somebody's been reading the chapter. Yeah. Okay. So, so the sun's opacity, right? When you think about it, all all we mean by a surface is that the light, the light bounces off, or in this case, the light is free to leave the surface since that's a source of light. Because at, before the surface of the sun, what is the light doing? Going all right, it's just going all around and it hits the surface and, and shoots free. And that's what your eye sees as the surface of the sun because what you're seeing is a photon that's representative of a black body with a certain color right, of yellow in this case, or white really. And so the, 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 the little photon that's leaving the surface of the sun is doing it because the opacity has gotten low enough that it can travel freely and your eye can see it. Right? So the question is what's causing the opacity of this observable layers? And I really wish the sun was out today because I wanted to, wanted to show you the observable layers because they have uh, some that you can really can see through a very simple telescope. The first one is the photosphere. And sometimes we call that the surface of last scattering because photons coming out of the sun are scattered in all directions in the sun and then when they hit that last surface, the thing we call the surface, uh, we, uh, which we call the photosphere, the photons fly free. Photosphere. And, and how can we see if we're the sun when they die? Yes, but don't ever do that. 
<laughs> yeah, not even a little bit. Uh, and the opacity that causes this, uh, or sorry, the thing that causes this opacity is something called uh, ionized hydrogen scattering. So if we have a lot of free electrons, we can uh, we can get a reaction. Or sorry, this is not ionized. What am I talking about? This is this is hydrogen. I guess it's technically ionized, but not in the way you're thinking. It doesn't lose an electron. It has an extra electron. So it's H minus, not H plus. And so these ion these do I want to call them ionized hydrogen? Protons. They're, no, they're not protons. They're proton, electron, electron. So they're ionized hydrogen atoms, but they're negatively charged. So we call it H minus scattering. Because there's all these free electrons, and this reaction goes both ways, right? If there's all these free electrons, you can get scattering of the electron off of the ionized hydrogen, but it's H minus, and that will give you um, uh, a. Uh, an exchange into a photon when that goes from an excited to a de excited state. Yeah? How can you have two electrons over from a photon? Uh, it's a very weakly bound configuration, but it can happen. Right? It's like asking how can you have two planets orbiting one star? There's nothing to keep another electron. What's that? Well, they're in the same orbit. Never mind. Yeah, so, so there's, it's, and I think I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't write down the energy here. Uh, I think it's like 0.7 elect, 0.75 electron volts to to disassociate this. So it's weakly bound. If you think about I, a hydrogen atom, you need 13.6 electron volts to break it apart. This is a hydrogen, so proton, electron, electron, and you can knock one of the electrons off with very little energy. So it's a weakly bound um, atomic state. And so this H minus scattering, and you can see this. Uh, You'll notice, and this isn't the best picture for this, but you'll notice that the edge of the sun is darker, right? Fainter than the other part. And that's because of this H minus scattering. Because if you're coming from the edge, you're traveling through more of the stuff, right? It's just like if the sun is setting, you get more scattering in, on the Earth because it's traveling through more atmosphere. Same here, you're getting light traveling through more of this atmosphere, and that's called limb darkening. And so you can see the scattering effect that's due to the limb darkening. Limb, L-I-M-B. So let me write down. So these are the observable layers. I'm going to put down as number two, limb darkening. And how quickly that limb darkening happens, you can figure out the, uh, the amount of scattering that's going on. So the limb darkening is just a function of how you're viewing the sun different thing than the Right. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's an effect, it's a, this is a geometric effect. Okay. okay. And then another thing that you're going to see is something called the chromosphere. And the chromosphere um, doesn't really, isn't really shown here, but it's the, you've ever seen a picture during an eclipse and you get that big, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, it's hotter than the surface. But it's very low density. Now, how, the, how does that get uh, how does that get hotter than the surface? That doesn't that seems to violate thermodynamics, because as you go out from the sun, it gets hotter to cooler. How come it suddenly gets hotter? It, we we think it's magnetic flux, but we're not sure. That's the competing theory right now: is that magnetic streams of magnetic particles that are getting pulled around by the sun's magnetic field are depositing energy into this relatively low density gas outside the sun, c uh, causing it to be hot. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah. How, how do we know that the chromosphere is so much hotter than the surface? Great question. So what we can do is you can measure. Um, so you can use something called a coronagraph, where you block out the surface of the sun. So all you see is the chromosphere and the corona. And then you can take a spectrum of that and figure out its, uh, its equilibrium temperature, its, its black body temperature, excitation temperature. And then we can measure the temperature that way. But what do we mean by temperature? What we're really saying is, what is the mean velocity of the gas? So we measure the mean velocity of the gas from the spectrum. And then that's what we call temperature. That's not what you would feel if you were there. It's so low density that if I put you there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even, like it would be the vacuum of space, right? But the velocity of the gas, and we'll do a problem here in a second, the velocity of the gas is very high. And so that's why we say it has a higher temperature. OK, so before we go on with solar wind, though, I did want to mention a couple of quick things about the sun on these slides here. Uh, first of all, composition of the sun. 
Uh, this is the composition of the sun. It's almost entirely hydrogen and helium, and these boxes are in proportion to the various elements that are in the sun. How do we know what these proportions are? Spectroscopy. Spectroscopy, exactly right. We look at the rainbows, and it tells us uh, what these proportions are. And this is interesting, hydrogen and helium, okay, we're good with that. That came out of the Big Bang. But let's look at the rest of the ones that are important. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Are those important? They are to us, right? So it's, it's interesting to me that the next largest abundance from hydrogen is oxygen. And we're water-based creatures. Why are we water-based? Probably because that's what was there. Yeah, I mean, it's the most abundant fluid at, at reasonable temperatures because uh, hydrogen and oxygen are the next two abundant ones. Yeah? So what makes that issue? Yeah, so the, the reason that this happens is because the uh, nuclear fusion processes in stars, and we'll talk about this when we get to stars, you fuse hydrogen into helium, and then you fuse helium up into oxygen, right, and carbon, but depending on the mass of the star. If you're not massive enough, you don't fuse all the way up to carbon. Most stars are massive enough to fuse up to oxygen. And so it just really represents the distribution of masses of stars that can make stuff. Right, you've got more low-mass stars than high-mass stars. So supermassive stars will have a lot more, a lot more carbon in them. Uh, they will have a lot more carbon in them, yes. And in fact, supermassive stars are necessary because almost all of this stuff gets destroyed in a supernova explosion, and then gets reformed during the explosion. And all of the elements heavier than iron come from the supernova explosion, and we'll talk about where all this stuff comes from. So. So we will get to all these reasons why these abundances are the way they are. Uh, but I do want to point out a couple of interesting things. One is carbon is right up there with oxygen. And uh, the interesting thing about carbon is that it binds with oxygen almost as well as hydrogen does. right? So if you're in a planetary system where you've got as much carbon as oxygen, it will prefer to bond into CO and you won't get water. You can have star systems that have no water in them because you have so much carbon that it sucked up all the oxygen. Right? So that's something we'll have to think about because uh, carbon and oxygen are right up there. So again, I tend to think about things in terms of astrobiological significance. This is a course in planetary uh, and stellar astrophysics. The fact that the things that you're made of are basically, you are basically hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. What are the most do dominant things? Why aren't you made of helium? Doesn't bind well, and then we wouldn't have anything for birthday parties, right? So you got hydrogen, uh, carbon, and oxygen. Next one on the list is nitrogen. Then you've got some uh, uh, argon and neon. Those are, are just relics because they don't bind with anything either. They're uh, uh, noble gases. What I think is interesting is up here, the things you don't see are phosphorus. And if there's one thing other than oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen that you would die if you did not have would be phosphorus. And this is the mystery of life, right? Because <coughs> phosphorus doesn't show up here. It's not anywhere close to being abundant at all. And yet your DNA has the backbone, right, of phosphates. ATP, remember from high school biology classes? Right, that's how you get all your energy when you eat your burger, it makes ATP. So when I look at things from an astrobiological perspective, I fully expect life to be hydrogen, uh, oxygen, and carbon-based. I don't expect it to have a backbone on its DNA of phosphate. That just is a happenstance of being here on Earth. Just throwing that out there, okay? Because it's not terribly abundant. Now, it could be something else. Um, there, uh, there are other things. Arsenic could be a replacement. We've never had any evidence of that, really. There was a funny little paper a few years ago, but, uh, but that's an interesting thing. And then things like, uh, uh, the, the other way, the reason this will come important later when we talk about planet formation is the sequence in which things uh, can uh, condense as you move further away from the sun. So what is the Earth made of? The Earth is made out of primarily of silicon, dioxide, and iron. Right? Now you'll notice iron and silicon aren't all that abundant, but they are really easy to condense at high temperatures to, compared to other stuff. Right? Uh, and we know why we have aluminum cans and soda. That's why we drink aluminum soda and aluminum cans, because aluminum and sodium are... No? <laughs> okay, that's not why? Okay. 
I thought it was. I thought that's why we only had enough soda to fit in all the aluminum cans. <laughs> you never see the other thing around. All right, so here's the, all right, here's the picture I wanted to show you of the photosphere. And this is uh, demonstrating another feature called uh, sunspots. And sunspots are not black. If I were to take a sunspot and bring it to this room, it would glow red. But it just looks black because it's cooler than the surrounding photosphere. Okay, so I should probably put sunspots on here. And sunspots, because what you're really measuring are magnetic fields. Because what's happening here is the sun is a, is a twisted, uh, if you imagine this, any spinning object with charge is going to generate a magnetic field. But then the sun, because it's made out of gas, spins, in a, spins differentially. The equator moves at a different speed than the poles. And so the magnetic fields get wrapped up. And sometimes they get wrapped up and they can, uh, they can wrap up so tight they can inhibit convection from the interior of the sun. That inhibiting of convection causes a cooling because you're not getting stuff, warmer stuff moving up to the top. That cooling looks like a sunspot. And they're these black little spots. And there's a sunspot cycle that is connected to the, uh, to the magnetic reversal cycle on the sun. The magnetic field on the sun reverses every astronomers, astronomy planetarium, 22 years? No, every 11 years. Every 11 years. Okay, so we get, we get this intense period of sunspot activity, and then it goes to a low period, then we get an intense period and low period, intense period, low period. This is how I know that sunspots aren't causing climate change. Because if climate change was caused by sunspots, they would have a periodicity of 11 years, and it does not. We also okay. have ice age every decade. Right, and we'd have an ice age. Now, there have been times when we've had periods where there have been very few sunspots for a long period of time, and that has affected the climate. The Maunder Minimum, uh, they have picture paintings of people ice skating in uh, places where the lakes never froze in northern Europe. So, so it can affect the climate. Well, this is the cycle that would have told us. This is a few years old, but it shows you the number of sunspots as a function of time. And we are... We're supposed to be up here, and we never quite made it. We're in a, a relatively inactive time. And that may be why we suddenly see a cooling trend in the global warming data. Because the sunspots do, when you have fewer sunspots, you get slight cooling. And it just so happens that we're getting this little bit of cooling in the global warming data. Maybe that's the impact of this. As soon as this is over, it's going to go right back up again. And won't that be fun? That'll be awesome. Um, the uh, pattern that sunspots make on the surface of the sun over time is called the butterfly diagram. And this is kind of a fun project because if you think about what you would do if you knew nothing about solar physics, this is exactly what you would do. Right? You'd go out and you would plot the latitude and longitude on the sun of every sunspot you observed over time. And what happens is the sunspot, and the cool thing is you've got so much data because this was easy to do with even simple telescopes. And so what you see is that every single one of these dots is a sunspot, and the color of the dots tells you how many sunspots they were, and you're plotting, plotting the latitude of those things. And you see that they, according to these cycles, they get more intense and move towards the equator, boom, 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 boom. and then you get a period of minimum where you don't get very many sunspots, and then you get boom, 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 and then you get a period of minimum without sunspots, and that is tracking the evolution of the sun's magnetic field. And you can see that happening. Uh, and you can also see that sometimes it's more active than others. So there's, there's the 11-year cycle, right? And then there's kind of this, uh, you can get uh, lower periods or higher periods as you go, go through there. Uh, the thing, that I li thing I find so interesting about this is that we're witnessing the reversal of magnetic fields. And we know this happens on the Earth, right? Because we have, in the geological record, we have magnetic field reversals. You see that as the magma comes up out of the uh, mid-oceanic trench, it uh, gets set due to the current magnetic field as it cools. And if it's the magnetic field's going this way, the atoms are set one way. If it's going the other way, it's set the other way. And you can measure the magnetism of that as it goes along. The period between those magnetic shifts is geologically short, right? Well, less than 100,000 years. But what we don't know is does the pole reversal of the, of the Earth happen over 100,000 years? Like, the, you know, the North Pole shifts around. We all know about the shifting position of the magnetic pole anyway, if you've ever done any orienteering. And that happens. Maybe it just slowly drifts over 100,000 years, and then the North Pole is south. 
right? Or is it doing this and then suddenly over the period of a week, phew, right? What's really fun if you've taken 2220 is you can calculate out the magnetic induction induced by the Earth's magnetic field moving that much and you can play with that time period and set it to a million years, set it to 10 years, set it to a day and see what the magnetic induction is and decide if we should worry about it. Because if it happened in a day, I'm pretty sure all of our electronic devices would fry. Right? Well, what could be happening in the Earth's core versus the moments like that? We have no idea. We have no idea. Because think about it. If the magnetic field of the Earth is caused by a spinning ball of molten nickel, which is what we think it's causing it, I want you to think about what you know about conservation of angle momentum and how challenging it would be to get that thing to flip over. So what's happening, right? We don't know. We don't know. And the reason we don't know is because uh, we make these predictions. So we say, oh, the, the magnetic field of the Earth is caused by a spinning core. Seems reasonable. But uh, Mercury has a large magnetic field, and it doesn't have a molten spinning core. Venus, which is as big as the Earth and should have just the same core as ours, does not have a magnetic field at all. So what's going on? We don't know. And the fact that it switches. So studying the sun is interesting because the sun, which is a big ball of gas, right, does switch its poles over observable time periods. And it does it quickly. Now it kind of, what really happens is it doesn't like, it just kind of, the magnetic field goes away and then shows back up again. But if that's happening, like that's not the same thing as taking the center of the Earth and flipping it over. If you did that, the magnetic field would stay there, right? It somehow it's is. Slowing down and the opposite I don't know. Yeah. I, I have no idea. Anyway, interesting stuff. We have n magnetic fields. We have no idea. Okay. Um, why do I have this? I don't care. Okay. Ah, this is what I wanted to show you. So this is the Maunder Minimum I talked about back between, uh, the, because sunspots, ever since Galileo pointed his, sun, his telescope at the sun, we've had a pretty good count of sunspots. Um, we know that there were very few sunspots for almost 70 years. And that uh, was called the Little Ice Age in Northern Europe. So uh, we may be entering another one of those periods. Would give us a that would that would be good because that would give us some breathing room to fix our carbon emissions. <laughs> if, in fact, if we could find a way to make the sun go into a monitor minimum, that would be good. Yeah. Do you ever have the opposite of that where you get a ridiculous amount for a long period of time? Well, it depends. You could argue that's what we've been in. Mm, no, it's hard to say. We don't know. We don't have enough data. That, that's yeah. a drop where that's. Yeah, well, so this and this I'd be a little suspicious. I don't think there were really more sunspots here than here. It's just there were more people observing the sun more often. But the fact that there are none here is saying something because they were observing way more than that. So I don't think you can, I don't think we have enough data to say. We have to wait another 400 years and see. But, uh, but no, we don't know. Um, they, it's, it's, it's shocking how much we don't know about stuff. And you read these textbooks and they're like, blah, blah, blah. We know all this stuff. Well, they're just telling you what we know now. But that's going to, we don't know what we know. Um, all right, so this is why I wanted to stop with and do a little calculation about the solar wind, because that is, uh, that is something that uh, is important for this process. I just talked about it, about helium-3 on the moon. And it's also important for uh, if we didn't have a magnetic field on the Earth, this would wipe us out. It's also something that, uh, that drives a lot of the um, interaction of the sun with the interstellar medium. The s pressure of the solar wind uh, is what's keeping the intergalactic, uh, sorry, interstellar medium from killing us all, right? Because <laughs> if you think about it, there's all these, all this highly energized particles flying out there. The sun's heliosphere, or the, the, the uh, uh, the heliopause and, the, and the, where, how the stellar wind is pushing against the, uh, the incoming uh, debris from the interstellar medium is important. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about the interstellar, uh, the, the stellar wind, and then we're going to talk about how we use this later on in atmospheric physics as well. So let's start by seeing if we can calculate the temperature at which the sun loses its outer layers, right? So how hot would you have to make this coronasphere to get the particles 
to fly away. And this is something known as atmospheric escape, and it's a competition between the thermal velocity of the gas and the gravitational velocity of the gas, or the escape velocity. How much, how much velocity does the gas need to leave the object? And I can write both of those down. I want to write down, you remember, the distribution of velocities for, um, so this is, uh, let's do this. This is the number of particles that have a given velocity. This is the given velocity. All particles have a distribution. It's not like they're all moving at the same speed. And that distribution is called a Maxwellian distribution. It looks something like this. It has this big, long tail. And the most likely, or I should say the, the uh, well, what we call the root mean square velocity of this gas is representative of, of, of the, uh, what we call the kinetic temperature. That's really what we call, the, that's how we define the kinetic temperature, is what is the root mean square velocity of this gas. And you can calculate that from, if you go back to your physics uh, textbook, you remember that that is equal to uh, 3kT over the mass of the particle in question, whatever this mass of particle is, to the 1 half. This is something that can be measured, right? The RMS velocity can be measured. Uh, and then we get what's called the kinetic temperature. That's the temperature associated with that velocity. It doesn't mean that's the temperature you'd feel. If I tuck, stuck a thermometer in the, uh, in the coronasphere, it wouldn't read anything. There probably aren't enough particles uh, to hit it uh, in any reasonable amount of time. So we want to compare this temperature to the escape speed. And how do you calculate the escape speed? Do you remember what two things do we compute? Or how do you get the escape speed? We take the amount of energy necessary to fire an object off the surface and compare that to when the velocity goes to zero due to the potential energy of the object that you're firing off of. We set those two equal to each other. And when we do that, we get the escape speed is equal to 2 times g, the mass of the object in question, divided by the distance, uh, or in this case, the size of the object or how far away you are from it, to the 1 half. So this is how far you are away from the object when you want to ask what the escape speed is. That's the mass of the object. And this is telling you what velocity you need to not be gravitationally bound. And if these things are comparable, uh, then you're going to lose your atmosphere, or you're going to blow material off the surface. So if the, if the atmosphere is hot enough, it will overcome uh, the gravitational pull. And it's even worse than that. Because of this large tail here, let's say the VRMS you know, is some value. right? There's all these particles that have velocities higher than that. Or let's say this is V escape. right? So any, any particle with a velocity higher than that is going to escape. But there's particles in there that have velocities that are 6, 10, 100, 500, 1,000 times. There's probably, if you have enough particles, one of them that's moving close to the speed of light. Right? I mean, because it's a distribution. It doesn't go to zero. Uh, so because of this, a general rule of thumb is that if the RMS speed is greater than 1 sixth, the escape speed. Did I do that right? Escape speed greater than, yes, one sixth, one sixth, greater than or equal to that, you will lose material. So if you can calculate this, calculate that, you can figure out. Um, this is for any object. You just change the mass of either the, uh, so you could do it with the moon and, and nitrogen if you were using nitrogen gas and the mass of the moon, right? So any object you have, you're worried about the, losing the atmosphere, this holds. Okay. So the 1 6 has to do with the shape of this distribution, right? So the if, and this assumes a Maxwellian distribution, which is what we get from our kinetic theory of gases. So, assuming you, so it's really assuming an ideal gas. If you assume an ideal gas, then this rule holds. If you, and, it's, and it's a rough rule that just has to do with the shape of this, of this distribution. Um, and now your, your book, if you brought your book in here, you've got a, uh, a picture of uh, the temperatures as a function of distance from the sun. And those are on page uh, 179. Looks like this, if you've got that here. But what I want to do is just, is just get temperature in terms of the distance away and then ask at the surface of the sun, what temperature do you need to be? Okay. 
So let's do that. I'm going to set these two things equal to each other, which is just 3kt to the 1 half divided by the mass of a proton, let's say, we'll just ignore the electron, is equal to 1 sixth times 2gm mass of the sun divided by the radius to the 1 half. So this is just using this equivalency. If this holds true, that temperature or higher is going to get you to, uh, to initiate a solar wind. So what temperature does that happen at? Um, I went ahead and computed this already. So I just solved this for the temperature. I'll leave that to you. It's like one of those cooking shows. You know, show you how to make it, then I pull out the pie that's already done. Okay. So if you calculate this out, I get a temperature that's about 5 times 10 to the 6th. Uh, Kelvin. And if you look at your um, graph here, the temperature hits 10 to the 5, just a little bit above the surface, or two, well, a little bit, I guess it's 2,000 kilometers above the surface of the sun, which is nothing, right? And then it goes into the corona sphere, and the corona is easily millions of degrees Kelvin. So you don't have to get very far off the surface of the sun to get to a million degrees Kelvin. And in fact, you don't even you don't even have to worry about how far you're off of the sun because you're so close to the surface relative to its size that you can just use the radius of the sun in this calculation. And you get about 10 to the 6, 5 times 10 to the 6. So you need to be in the corona uh, to initiate this solar wind, but it's very easily getting at those temperatures. So that tells us that the sun has temperatures that will cause a solar wind. So we expect to see a solar wind shooting off the sun. And the cool thing about solar winds is you can measure them. And we've done this. We sent out a probe uh, called SOHO, as well as others, that have measured the properties of the solar wind at the Earth's and I'm going to write those down here real quick. The properties of the solar wind at the Earth's difference, distance. So R equals one astronomical unit. Uh, the velocity of that gas is about 400 kilometers per second. And the density of that gas is 10 to the minus 21 kilograms per cubic meter. And so is in the same orbit, right? Yeah, well, it's in the, one of the Lagrange points. I think I've got, let's see here, do I have some... I have some video here. Oops. Yeah, here we go. Um, let's go back here. Yeah, I like this one because it shows comets plunging into the surface of the sun. Play that again. Do you see the comet? Where is the comet? There are two comets. Yeah, I think that was a coincidence. I don't think it hit the sun. It might have. It might have. But you can see the material that's flying out here is, can be detected. And you can measure the velocity and you can measure the gas density and you can measure it at a given distance. Those shapes are based on the magnetic field. Those shapes that you see, yeah, that's that the fact that they're they have those sort of filamentary structures that you're looking at the magnetic field dragging material out. And we'll talk about prominences in just a second because I've got some more, more videos to show you. Um, all right, so how much mass is leaving the sun? A lot. A lot. Anybody have any other guesses? No, so how, much, so how much do you think? Well, the sun's like 10 to 30 kilograms, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a, that's a guess. I, I like that. Ten to the guess. Ten to the three kilograms per day, which is a lot. Ten to six. Ten to the six. All right. Ten to the six. Million kilograms per day. Anybody else? Anyone want to throw up a guess? Million and one. Million. One dollar. Who else? About ten to six minus one. 10 to 6 minus 1. Anybody want to guess 1 kilogram? Anyone? The, the closest without going over. It's like Price is Right rules. All right, $1. There you go. Okay, so there's some guys. We suspect it's going to be a lot, but it can't be a significant fraction of the sun because the sun's still here after 5 billion years. But none of these are a significant fraction of the sun. Okay, so what do we expect? We expect the answer to be big, but not too big. 
Okay. So let's see what we get. Well, what we're going to do here is imagine, how do you do one of these calculations? The only reason I'm doing this is to show you how astronomers think. How do we know the sphere of the surface of the sun at the radius curve? Right. That's what we're going to do. So let's write that down. Right? But this, so so how, do you, how do you estimate these types of things? You don't have any tools except what you knew in 2210, 2220. Right? That's all you know. So the first thing we do is write down the sun. I did. That's a sweet circle. I did. All right. I drew. Oh, and then we draw down the atmosphere. Sorry, write down the atmosphere. This atmosphere we're going to blow off has a certain size, delta r, and it has a certain the sun has a certain size. We'll call that little r. We'll call this delta little r. And so I can write down the amount of mass in that ring that we're going to blow off. The amount of mass in that ring, delta m, is equal to. 4 pi r squared, that's the surface area of the sun, right? But I need a volume, so I'm going to multiply that by delta r. And then I have to multiply that, since that's a volume, I multiply it by the density. So density times volume equals mass. And this is a differential amount of mass coming off of here. Everything okay out there? I always get nervous when I hear shouting. Shelter in place. Okay. Now, how do I turn this into a mass loss rate? I'm not going to integrate it yet. I want a mass loss rate. Divide both sides by the time. Divide both sides by the time, right? Because how do I get a rate? I just say, well, the amount of mass loss per unit time is this. Well, where would I put my delta t? I'm going to put it here because what does this look like now? Yeah. dr dt, which is? A differential rate. A differential rate, which we have a special name for. A what? A no. A rate change of distance over time, which is called a velocity. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's called a velocity, which is a derivative, but it has a special name. That special name is velocity. Right? So I can write this down now. If we, if we assume delta t and delta r are infinitesimally small, because we can do that, I can write down that dm dt is equal to 4 pi r squared times the velocity times the density. So the density of the gas times the velocity times the distance will tell me the mass loss rate. And now this is independent of where I am. I can do it anywhere I measure it. I can measure it at the surface of the sun. I can measure it at 1 AU. But I measured it at 1 AU, and I have these values of r, v, and rho. So I know everything. So I can calculate the mass loss rate, which your book writes as m sun dot. Right? These are equivalent to each other. Uh, is equals, are you ready? Yeah. 10 to the 8th kilograms per second. I was so, close. So, what is, so these were in kilograms per day. So how many seconds in a day? Uh, 60 times 60 times 24. 60 times 60 86, or 84,600, 86,400. Somebody calculate that out for me. Do, 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 do. It, it's uh, 60 times 60 times 24, 86,400. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to multiply this. That's 9 times 10 to the 4. So we'll call it 10 to the 5. So this is equal to 10 to the 13, roughly, kilograms per second. Closest without going over, or sorry, kilograms per day. Closest without going over is 10 to the 9. But you're still off by four orders of magnitude. 10,000 times too small. So let's put this into perspective, though. This is about 10 to the 8th kilograms per second is about 100,000 tons per second. Now, if you put that in terms of the sun, right, it would take 10 to the 14 years to lose all that mass. The sun is only 10 to the 9 years old, and it's only going to get 10 to the 10. So it would take you 10,000 times longer than the total lifetime of the sun to lose it. So is the sun going to get appreciably smaller That's during its lifetime? Yes. Yeah. Well, so far. Right. Right. It's yeah. Current age. Current age of the universe. <laughs> there you go. But the, yeah, the sun, the sun will die before it loses that. Okay. Um, well, let me put it this way. The sun's mass loss rate is going to increase dramatically at about 5 billion years from now. Okay, uh, so we've got uh, 100,000 tons per second. Let's put that into perspective. I looked up a couple of numbers. A battleship. How big is a battleship? 60,000 tons. 
it's just think about this. I want you to picture this for a minute. So two battleships. Two, two battleships like pew 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 pew, pew just battleships flying off of the sun. Battleships, okay? It gets even better. A uh, Starship Enterprise, uh, and I picked my favorite one, the uh, NCC 1701E, next generation. That's a, that's a, not a Constitution class, that's a, none of you are Star Trek fans. It really depresses me. I got a red shirt the other day. You know the red shirts from Star Trek? I've watched all of Battlestar Galactica, except for the boring part. You said you yeah. the last Have you seen the original Battlestar Galactica? It's awful. It is. I love it. Especially when they did the flying motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, how, mu how much does the Starship Enterprise weigh? Oh, so depressed. You should just know this stuff. 3.2 million tons. So that is uh, two decimal place, or one decimal place bigger than this, right? So that's 10, no, a tenth of an enterprise per second. So every 10 seconds, next generation enterprise flies out of the sun. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot, right? Is that, that's, is that before yeah. or after they deploy the core? Uh, it's after, okay. yeah. That's the width the core is 3.3. Yeah, so that's after. Yeah, very good. Glad you paid attention. All right. Oh, I can't believe it. I should, you know, I'm going to dock you all 500 points on this exam for not knowing what class of starship that is because I can't remember. Now, <laughs> the mass loss. Let's take a look at how dramatic this can be because it sounds like a lot. But it also sounds like not so much, depending on how you calculate it. But what happens when a big solar flare event, remember, this is the average mass loss. What happens when a big solar flare event happens? Well, you can see, let's take a look at the SOHO data. We've got, um, don't want the comments. Let's go look at. Well, that actually raises yeah. the question. How do satellites like SOHO and Hubble survive solar flares? Very carefully. Uh, they're built for it, right? So, so, so in, in a period of, this is a really good question because they, in the period of uh, high solar activity, they basically put their butts to the wind, right? They take the, air, the spacecraft and turn them around. Because if, the, if a big solar flare hits the array, like the detector array, it's fried. So they usually turn it so that the, you know, the housing of the spacecraft is to block it, right? Well, so before we had SOHO, not much, right? But now that we have SOHO, let's, let's take a look at this. This is looking in x-rays. And I want to point out a couple of features about the sun. There are these things called prominences that uh, eject out of uh, sunspot activity regions. And you can see, I think, that those are uh, kind of the shape of the magnetic fields, right? And every once in a while, these magnetic field lines will connect, and you'll see a big piece of material blast off, right? Is this SOHO? This is SOHO footage, yeah. So I think here's one, here's one over here where you see this thing right here. If these two lines connect, that produces enough energy to just blast it off the surface. And those are, um, let's see, let's go back to, um, where are the solar flares? Increase in solar activity. Ah, here we go, erupting prominences, this is my one. So let's see if we can, yeah, oh, let's see if we can see one here. Oh, there was one down here. Let's see if we can see another one. So I one go like this. They're easier to see at the, at the limb here. Now you don't see a big bunch of it, but, oh, there was one right there. You don't see a big bunch of it because the sun's bright, right? And this stuff is going to be lower temperature and it's not very visible. So in order to really see it, you have to go to uh, the uh, coronagraph. And the coronagraph is where, well, let's see if I've got, yeah. Um, oh, this is it. Yeah. So this mixes a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different wavelengths. And you'll be able to see, looking at the sun, so this is just looking at the sun all by itself. This is with the coronagraph. And you can really start to see 
uh, if you can block out the center part of the sun. And what they are doing is blocking it out and then laying on pictures from other instruments so you can kind of see it all at once. So these are where these prominences start. And you can see how they can flare out. They follow the magnetic field lines. Um, if those magnetic field lines reconnect, they'll become big prominences that stick out. And then you'll see a big bunch of debris shoot out the side. And then all of this stuff that you're seeing is a solar flare hitting the detector. So that's debris that's that that's hitting the detector. We should watch that again. So what fraction of C are these particles traveling when you flare off? Uh, well, you could calculate that. So let's should we? I, I think we should calculate that because that's the type of person I am. So let's look at the dates here. So this is April 18th at 8 o'clock. I'm gonna write down these times. April 18th at 8 0800. Let's say. Just order of magnitude. Okay, so now what we want to watch for is when the solar flare happens to, which I guess we didn't need to write down this time, when the solar flare happens to when you see the speckly stuff. Okay, because that's going to tell you. Uh, so let's see if I can stop this. So there we get a flare, but we'll wait for the big one here. So as soon as we get the big one, I'll stop it. It should be right... There. Okay, so that was the 21st at 0100. What's that? Oh, 1300. Really? Oh, no, that's 0100. Yeah, 0100. Because it's on a 24 hour clock, right? So 0100. And I'm just doing order of magnitude here, so I'm not going to worry about that. So then this flares out, boom. And then when the speckles hit, which was pretty much right there, is the next day at 3 o'clock. So the next day at 1 o'clock. I thought it was at the 20, oh, 21st. Same day at 3 o'clock. So two hours later, right? Speed of light between here and the sun is 8 hours. So two hours is a 200 and, 100, no, 200, 120 minutes. So what's 120 divided by 8? So 6.6% 6 .6 C. 6.6. So you know, not bad. You know, not bad at all. Not relativistic by any means of the... But enough so you could get, so when the sun starts to become more active, they issue, if you ever go to spaceweather.com, they issue alerts that says, oh, the sun is more active. But when they see a giant solar flare pop off the surface, you've got a couple of hours, right? So if something like this happened on spaceweather.com, they might say, oh, you've got two hours, and then this is going to go. Why did they turn the detector? It wasn't that big of a flare. This is a small flare. Yeah. It's not, and probably it's still degrading the instrument, like eroding the, the, the. That's right. All right. So let's see. Is there anything else? What's this one? Well, we got to let's look at some more of these, because I just can't get enough of this stuff. Okay. Um, let's do. Let's go. Spectacular CMEs. These are called coronal mass ejections, and they are spectacular. Okay, the sound effects are important. Got that? Are you picking that up? Battleship. Yeah, look at that. A battleship every second. Pew, 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 pew. You're never going to think of the solar wind again, are you? Yeah. So, so, this, and so why doesn't this really affect the Earth? Magnetic fields. So I've got pictures here of... Let's see here. Where do I... Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's we'll, we'll look at some of these stills here. So again, the coronal mass ejection starts as a prominence that is following magnetic field lines. If those magnetic field lines reconnect, you can blast material off the surface. And uh, and I love these X-ray images because you can see literally see the magnetic fields of the sun. Now, the cool thing about this is that the magnetic field of the sun is critical to understanding how the sun works. And yet, almost every other star, almost every other star that we know of, we can't measure the magnetic field. That's tricky. Because if the magnetic field is such an integral part to stars, how do we do all this stellar astrophysics without magnetic fields? We're waiting for new astrophysicists to figure that out. OK, so I think I showed those guys. Ah, yes. So this is a schematic of what the Earth's magnetic field does when it intersects the, uh, 
the solar wind or one of these solar flares. Uh, I, I got to study under Van Allen. He was one of the first people to launch rockets uh, into orbit to study radiation fields and they named the radiation belts after him. These are trap charge particles that get trapped in belts around the Earth. They're trapped by our, our magnetic field. Um, you can see that material coming in like this is going to be swept out of the way just as if a boat was traveling through uh, the solar wind. Except sometimes you get particles that uh, get trapped in the magnetic field and they bounce back and forth. And when they bounce back and forth, they impact the atmosphere, they cause the aurora uh, to in the north, and the aurora in the south are symmetrical because the particles are going like this. And one of my other professors used to work with a team where one team went to Alaska uh, to uh, study the northern lights and one team went to Antarctica and they would compare their results to see if they truly were symmetric and they were uh, studying those uh, those radiation belts. So how do they do that? They just use astronomical mapping and catalog Yep. Operations. Yeah, and they would just they would locate the, the location, space and time, altitude azimuth from their location, uh, and then compare that. Well, we can compare simultaneously now with the ISS or Yes, yeah. At this time they didn't have you know, space-based observation. They were doing it all from the ground. And frankly, even though I've been to Antarctica and really enjoyed it, I think Alaska would have been more fun. You know, they had more recreation after they were off work. <laughs> Whereas my, my professor was sleeping in a tent with penguins. <laughs> Just to stay warm. Just making sure everyone knows about that. Uh, all right, so uh, yeah, so here's a picture of the northern lights. And how the northern lights work uh, are very similar to a fluorescent bulb, right? I mean, you've got low density gas up there that uh, you're smacking into it with the solar wind that excites it, but there's not enough other atoms for it to hit into, so it doesn't uh, de excite collisionally, it gives off photons. And if you've, how many people have seen the northern lights? Yeah, oh yeah, you were in Alaska, weren't you? Yeah, so, and you've seen, where were you when you saw them? Up in Canada, yeah. You can see them from Utah sometimes. Yeah, I was going to say, I remember yep. like a year ago or something, I saw something that looked like Northern Lights yeah. while you, I was on a mountain. Yep, uh, you may have seen that because in very high activity uh, periods, the solar wind, because if you we go back to this picture and you imagine, you know, these magnetic fields are intersecting the surface all the, all the time. What, where the particles get trapped on the magnetic field depends on their strength. If they've got enough energy to get down to some of those lower magnetic fields, they can go to lower latitudes and get trapped for a little while. But that usually only happens when, yeah, you probably have seen them. You can see them from Utah sometimes. Now, this is ISS observations of the Earth and you can see what the aurora look like, and you can even see them, again, the symmetry of it on Saturn, right? There's the, again, the exact same aurora on both sides, and that's due to the magnetic field of the sun. Uh, all right, so the last thing I want to mention, and we're just about out of time, is uh, what's going to happen to the sun as it begins to move out of its current local interstellar medium into a denser interstellar medium. Right now, we're kind of between uh, arms in the galactic, uh, spiral arms just on the edge of one. If we move into a denser region of interstellar space, what's going to happen to the uh, extent of the solar wind? It's going to collapse. And here's the interesting thing is that the, uh, in, in another, I think it was, what was it, 30 million years or something like that, it's going to collapse in to within the Earth's distance. <laughs> So this is interesting because right now the solar magneto magnetosphere and solar wind protects the Earth from the interstellar medium, just like the Earth is protected from the interplanetary medium by its magnetic field. So when we push that in, the Earth will suddenly be sitting out in the interstellar medium. Now, here's the other interesting part. If the Earth goes through a magnetic reversal that disengages the magnetic field for a short period of time while we're hanging out in the interstellar medium, we're all going to, well, or maybe, maybe there's a, be a proliferation of, of, uh, of evolution mutations. Well, right? I don't know. What's that? There you go. Yeah. yeah. What was that name? If you don't eliminate the magnetic field for a period of time, you're lost there. It's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so this is one of the questions I have about these magnetic reversals, right? Because if even I mean, let's just look at it from the forget the heliopause. Let's think about it from the stellar wind. If the magnetic field turns off for a long period of time, that's that's not good. 
right? <laughs> you could have, it's basically like suddenly you're living in outer space if there's no magnetic field. Well, the atmosphere does some job of protecting us, but with no magnetic field. So these magnetic reversals, which on the sun happen in days, right? On the Earth, if they took long, much longer than that, you know, 1,000 years, 100,000 years, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You said you can look at the top on the Earth. That's turned in the past? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are we able to actually look at the soil and see what's happened to it? Yeah. A thousand years where we didn't have a magnetic. So, so not directly, but there are scientists who look at um, the... So there are, there are isotopes of molecules that don't persist on the Earth for very long, right? And, but they are in the interstellar wind. And so you can find radioactive isotopes embedded in the, in the sea sludge that tells you basically a history of what the solar wind has been doing to the Earth. And the problem with that is it's, it's hard to date it. Like, you know the sequence. You can say, oh, there was an solar wind activity here, whatever, but you can't say, and that happened one million years ago because it's very difficult to, to date it. So you can see the sequence, but you can't match it up very well. And people have been trying to do this, right, uh, for for long periods of time. But it's but one of the one of the one of the studies I was telling you about is uh, is looking at that type of thing for when the Earth passes or when the Sun passes into a denser interstellar cloud and our heliopause collapses. That should show up in the the sedimentology of the ocean bed, and they think it does. So that's why we think it's been happening. Did you have another question, Nate? Uh, no, I just said you wouldn't know what the initial amount of the isotope was. The deposit. Right. So, yeah, so you can't date it from dating. And, and because it's sea sludge and not, like, stratified rock, you can't say, oh, this fossil was here and that fossil I know lived 7 million years ago. It's very hard to do, to do the datings because you don't know the rate at which the sea sludge has been dropped down. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop there because I was going to go observe the sun, uh, but we don't have any sun to observe. So I guess I'll just have to show you this one more time. Where is it? Facebook? No. This. We'll check in and see how we're doing today on the solar panels since we can't observe. 1.21 kilowatts? <laughs> no way. Anyway. All right. Where so I know, you're, it's impossible. Gigawatts, what do we call it? Gigawatts. 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 <laughs> All right. So the last thing I want to leave you with, though, is I do have um, your next homework assignment is online. No, it's due next Thursday. I think you've been punished enough for one period of time. You probably could use a little. little. It's been a long week. How was that? So what, well, let me turn this off first. So